know, to lead the church forward, forward with the building project. As a matter of fact, I will be sharing a little bit about that and uh, about some of the things that, that have been happening in our church. Um, so I'm 21. Uh, I got saved when I was 21 years old. Uh, it was back in 1995, which uh, now you can calculate how old I am. And um, I'm, I'm from a non-Christian uh, background, um, but somehow God got a hold of my heart and um, I became a Christian, uh, worked a couple of years in, in business and, uh, and then uh, I, I sensed God's call in my heart. So I moved down to Belgium, sold my house and, uh, and basically uh, started studying at a Bible school because what do you do when you don't have any open doors but you feel called to ministry? You go to a Bible school, right? That's what I did. Met my wife there. Uh, she's from Austria. And uh, we, have, uh, we now have a, a twin boys, they're, uh, they're five years old, and I miss them like crazy, and I just can't wait to uh, you know, squeeze the life out of them tomorrow uh, when I get back to, uh, to Amsterdam. So it's really am amazing to still be here today. You know, um, I'm, I'm always looking for, um, for friends. You know, I'd love to be your friend. Uh, there's my Twitter name on there, so be sure to follow me if you're on Twitter or add me on Facebook. Um, and uh, just uh, just cool to kind of see what's going on in your life and uh, just to stay connected as well and uh, see God do great things both here as well as in, uh, in Europe. Well, how many of you have ever fallen asleep during a boring lecture or over a boring book? All right, you guys are, you know, yeah, in the last service, more people fell asleep during... You know, boring lectures and so on. As a matter of fact, I hope you don't fall asleep today. As a matter of fact, why don't you just uh, turn to the person next to you and say, uh, say, say, wake up. <laughs> All right, everybody awake now? Okay, that's good. You know, the, many people actually think that the Bible is a boring book. And I can kind of understand it if you start with Leviticus. You know, Leviticus, it's it's. A great book. Uh, it's, it's full of laws, full of prescriptions from the Lord, and, and there's some great messages actually behind it. You could actually do a sermon series on the book of Leviticus, and it, may, it will make a whole lot of sense to you when you do that. However, it's not the most inspiring book when you kind of start with that. You, it's probably better to start somewhere in the New Testament or, uh, you know, some other stories uh, in the New Testament. You know, the Bible is full of very interesting and even exciting stories, and not only that, the Bible is full of, of God's promises to his people and to us individually as well. How many believe that? Yeah. And that's why we got to read God's word, right? Because we got to let those promises and those stories speak to our hearts because it will build our faith. It will lift our faith so that God can do uh, greater things in our lives. And uh, no, today I want to turn with you to, uh, to a story that really speaks to me personally. And it is in, uh, in Joshua chapter 3. And, um, and I just want, you know, if you have a Bible, you know, on paper, just turn to that. If you have an eye Bible or whatever it is, turn to that as, as well. Uh, there will be some verses up on the screen, but it's always better to have it in front of you as well. Um, and um, so, um, so basically my question to you is this. The question I want to answer today is this. How can you take hold of God's promises for your life and for this great church? How many of you want to lay hold of God's promises? That's about three of you. Come on, you guys can do better, better than that. How do you want to get hold of God's promises? Yeah. Okay, that sounds better. I'm going to continue now. Um, so God had promised a piece of land to, uh, to his people, to the Israelites. And Moses, who was their leader, was the one who was supposed to lead them, to lead the Israelites to the promised land. Moses was the, was the one who was, who was supposed to do that. And, uh, but the problem is Moses messed up. He made some big mistakes. And not only that, the people of Israel, they kind of disobeyed God. And uh, so, um, so instead of just, you know, what, taking the, what is it, like 20-day journey or whatever it is between Egypt and the promised land, they ended up spending 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days, for, sorry, 40 years in the desert. Not 40 days, 40 years in the desert. Now, I don't know about you, I'm a little impatient person, so when, whenever my exit for the freeway back home is, is closed off for roadworks and I have to make a 10-minute detour, I'm kind of bummed. How about you? I don't have a lot of patience. So imagine being in the desert for 40 years, the scorching sun, you know, on your, on your bald head or whatever you have. You know, just, it's, it's crazy. I mean, I just came back from Florida, and it was pretty hot there. And um, you can probably see it in my face right now. But um, it, it's, imagine doing that for 40 years. And that's kind of the, the time that it took for, for all that 
the previous generation to kind of die out so that only those people who didn't disobey God uh, will be able to enter the land. But the promise that God had given to his people, you know, it just didn't die with that previous generation. It was still there. God still wanted to fulfill his promise to the Israelites. And now, uh, basically, uh, Joshua, the successor of Moses, was supposed to, uh, so to lead the people to, to the promised land. And this is what, what God says to Joshua in uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse 3. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set foot, you will be on land I have given you. You will be on land I have given you. Now, I don't know what Bible translation you have in front of you. There's many Bible translations out here that make a big mistake. Even, you know, some of the Dutch translations that we have, most of them are actually wrong, and very few of them are right. Uh, because the Hebrew actually behind this passage, behind this verse, actually suggests what I just read to you, um, that God has promised a land that, that he had already, sorry, let me repeat it from here, that you will be on land that I have given you. So it's like past tense. God has already given the land and they just needed to take possession of it. God had already taken the land. It's not like, you know, whenever I set a foot, foot over here, that, that, that piece of land becomes my property. No, that is my property already. The only thing I need to do is to set foot in it, and it's mine. Yeah. That's basically what God is saying here to Joshua. God had already given the land. And you know what? God has already given you the land. He has already given you some promises and as a matter of fact, they've already been given to you. Everything has already been done up in heaven. And now you need to lay hold of it, you know, here on earth. You know, God has made some promise. He's given you some promises in the spiritual realm. And the only thing that you need to do is take hold of them in the physical realm. Thy will be done, Jesus said, on earth as it is in heaven, right? And that is my... First important point that I want you to take home. You know, at our, our church, I want to tell you a little bit about our church. We, every time, we, I want to make God's word practical to people. Because God's word is alive and active and it changes our, our everyday lives. I truly believe that. It's not something we just learn about or so on a Sunday morning. It should impact our lives, right? So, that means that, um, that, that, that I want to give practical take-homes for people. And some of them are a little bit more practical than others. So this first one is maybe not as practical as the other ones I'm going to give to you. But this is the first take-home that I want you to write down on your, on your notes page in the, in the bulletin that you have received. And it's this one. If you want to see God's promises fulfilled, you need to lay hold of it. Of in, sorry. I just got to start all over. The sen- start, start the sentence all over again. I, I'm, trying to, I'm getting ahead of myself. If you want to see God's promises fulfilled, you need to lay hold of in the physical realm what God has already given to you in the spiritual realm. Lay hold of in the physical realm what God has given to you in the spiritual realm. Turn to the person next to you. Say say to them, I'm taking the land. Great. Now, the same is true for this church. There are promises that God has given to this church. You know, I like to kind of check out websites of churches that I'll be speaking at, kind of learn a little bit about their history, learn a little bit about the vision that the church has. And I found this interesting statement here on the website I think is, is very, you know, is very important. From across the globe, Hispanics, Africans, Asians, Pacific Islanders, and Caucasians, God has called us together to be a model of love, reconciliation, and harmony, united under the banner of Jesus Christ. God has positioned us here to influence those who influence the world. And that last part of the sentence, I believe, is a prophetic promise that God has given to this church. And you guys are actually walking in it. God has positioned us here to influence those who influence the world. You know, think of all the services here that you guys have. You have a Messianic congregation. There, is a, uh, there are Spanish cor- um, services. There is, uh, there, there, there's, there's Filipino services. What, what else do you ha- guys have here in this building? I uh, already mentioned that one. Brazilians, of course. The Brazilians are everywhere, right? <laughs> Taking over the world. So, so, you have, so you have all these different nationalities here. 
And you know what? Our church is the same way. We have about 30 different nationalities. We do have Brazilians as well. You know, and, and we have, you know, we have people from South, a lot of people from South Africa, for instance, and they're actually really taking over the world. Um, so we got all these au pairs, and they're only there for about a year, and then they get sent back to either South Africa or they move on to another place. And, you know, what God has deposited in them while they are at our church for this one year is so much that when they go out, they're excited, they, they're on fire for God, and they're, they're, they're going to plug into another church, they're going to serve, they're going to help, they're going to do some amazing things for God, they're going to serve their host families, who sometimes often don't even believe in God, and they're just going to get a clear, give them a clear picture of who Jesus really is. You know, it's a places where we cannot be as believers, but those au pairs can be there. And, and the same is true for this church. You know, you are influencing those who will influence the world in turn. But let me tell you this. What you've seen so far is only the beginning of the great things that God has in store for you guys. He has given you so much more. So take hold of what God has already given to you. Let's lay hold of those promises. You know, God will do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or imagine. Wow. That verse in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21, they, they, they just, I mean, they're so powerful. As a matter of fact, because they are so powerful, we end every service with, with those two verses, kind of like a benediction. Because whenever people read this, it's like their faith is confirmed. They know that God is going to do more than they've experienced up to, the, up to this point. And we've seen it happen in people's lives. Lives that are being transformed. God coming through in miraculous ways for people who are struggling financially or who have lost jobs. And God is just providing for people. It's amazing. And when we take God at his word, you know, the best is yet to come. Take the land that God has given for you, given to you. But how would Joshua do that? How would this happen? How would this, uh, this land that has been promised to his forefathers, how would it become theirs? Let's, let's back up about 20 years. You know, Moses had become the leader of a, a group of people, uh, of slaves in, in uh, you know, of the Israelites who were living in Egypt at that time. And, um, and, 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 and God wanted him to take them out of their slavery back to the promised land that he had given to them. But before that happened, God first had to perform miracles through him. Because otherwise, what was going to happen? If, if, if Moses just showed up, I mean, this guy was, you know, um, he was... You know, like he grew up in Pharaoh's household. He had studied like, you know, all the, the best schools, you know, the most expensive schools that you could imagine in Egypt. He was, he was part of those schools. He had studied in those schools. So he was more of an Egyptian than he was an Israelite. So they would have distrusted him automatically. So he actually had to perform miracles so that the Israels would believe that he was actually sent by God. Because the Israelites had lost their faith in God. You know, they're, they're like, uh, you know, God, if you're real, you have forgotten about us. You've forsaken us. We're here for 400 years, and, and we can't see any way out. And then this guy shows up with a, lot, a whole lot of talk. Who are you, Moses? He had to perform those miracles to get them plugged in, to get them to commit to his leadership. But also he had to perform miracles. He had to perform, you know, those, tw those, tw those 10, uh, you know, uh, signs, th those 10 uh, plagues that had to come over Egypt to force Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. It all had to happen. And now Joshua had to take the place of Moses. You know, he needed some, a similar kind of com uh, confirmation from the Lord, you know, upon his leadership so that the Israelites would follow him. Moses left very big shoes to fill. But God had a plan. So he said this to, to, to Joshua. Today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I'm with you just as I was with Moses. So from the perspective of the people, Joshua would have had to perform a miracle or to at least be involved in a miracle that God would do for them to really accept him as their new leader. After they had heard all those stories, you know, from what happened in Egypt, the plagues, the, the, the you know, passing through the Red Sea, and, you know, the, the miraculous food and, and water that God provided for them in the, in the desert, all that kind of stuff. You know, who are you, Joshua? Imagine this, this one guy, this, this punk just stepping up to you. Hey, I'm, I'm supposed to lead you further. Who are you, Joshua? 
He had to be confirmed, divinely confirmed by God so that he could lead. So how would Joshua fill Moses' shoes? God continues to speak to Joshua. Verse 8. Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps. Take a few steps into the river and stop there. God says that those priests, the spiritual leaders, they were to go first. They had to get their feet wet before the whole nation would cross the Jordan River. The only problem was that in that time of the year, and the Bible specifically tells you this, that uh, the Jordan River would overflow its banks. And normally speaking, maybe you could wade through the river, but in those days, you know, this part time of the year, you cannot wade this river because there's just too much water. You know, those, imagine you know, all those people that would drown and, and the, the babies and, and, um, and, and all the animals and whatever, it will, it will drown in the river. So something had to happen. It's kind of this, this whole assignment just didn't make any sense. So here's what happens. Verse 9. So Joshua told the Israelites, Come and listen to what the Lord your God says. Today you will, sure, will know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Gerishites, Amorites, and the Jebusites ahead of you. Look, the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord of the whole earth, will lead you across the Jordan River. Now here, notice this. Joshua first builds the Israelites their faith before he gives them a strategy. He first builds up their faith before he gives them a strategy on what to do. This is profound. Tell your person sitting next to you, this is good preaching. <laughs> Just kidding with you. <laughs> So one of the things that he says about, about Joshua, uh, sorry, about, that Joshua says about God is that he's the living God. God is alive. He's not some kind of dead idol that is made of wood or stone or whatever, metal. No, he's the living God. He cannot be contained by any, you know, object, in, in, like, like, in, in, like a dead object. He cannot be contained by any of that. He's the living God. Now, that's good news because he's going to need his living God, you know, to lead him across the, the Jordan River, right? And then he doesn't only say that. He says that, 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 that God is also uh, the Lord over the whole earth. God is not some kind of local God. You know, you got to understand that in this, in this time, the, the different religions in those days, and there were lots of religions in those days. I can tell you that. You know, you had the Egyptians with all their kinds of gods, and, and those gods, they were kind of like limited to time and space. They were, uh, you know, uh, they, were, they were real local. And then, of course, the Canaanites, they had all kinds of gods, and they were, they were pretty local as well. You know, you see sometimes in Bible stories that you know, there are gods of the hills, and there are gods of this, and there are gods of that. And, and, and so they're limited in, in, in many ways. But, you know, the God of, of Joshua, the God of Moses, this God is not limited to time and space. As a matter of fact, you know, he performed the miracles, you know, right in front of the, the, uh, the Israelite leaders. He performed miracles. You know, he, he, uh, he sent the plagues down on Egypt, you know, when they were in Egypt. So God is a God over Egypt. And then they got to the desert. Same thing happened. God is the God over the desert. He, he made a way through the water. So he's so is God over the water too. And then they got to the desert on the other side. And, and you know, they were starving. They, were, they, had, they needed food. They needed all kinds of things. They needed drink. And God sends quills. He sends manna. He sends water. All the things that they needed. God is the God of the desert. And then they got to the border of the, uh, of the promised land. The Canaanites were living there, and, and, and God would show up there again. God is the God over the promised land, over the land of the Canaanites. He's God everywhere. He's not limited by time and space. The same God who led Joshua, who did miracles for Joshua, is here today and is at work in your life, as work in this church, going to do great things as you guys keep moving. And then Joshua says, he will lead you across the Jordan River. Joshua believed that God would make a way for his people, even though he wasn't sure what that would look like. God didn't specifically tell him that he would part the Jordan, the Jordan River like he parted the Red Sea. He didn't say that. 
But Joshua thought, well, if he did it back then, I, you know, I'm sure hope he's going to do it today. So he did that. So he said that. And now Joshua starts to give some instruction. He starts to share some strategy with the Israelites. You know, he builds their faith at first. Now he's going to give them, you know, this is how we're going to do it. This is how we're going to take the land. And he says this. Pretty weird. Now choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel. One from each tribe. Doesn't say anything more than just that. Choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel. Seems to me like when I read this that, that, that Joshua is trying to get some, some buy-in from all the different tribes that kind of make up the, the Israelites, the whole people of Israel. So there's 12 tribes there. You know, it's, I don't have 12 fingers. So there's 12 tribes there. And, uh, and he wanted all of those tribes to be involved. He want all, want, wanted all of them to feel ownership of what they're about to do. The only problem is he didn't know or he didn't say what they were supposed to do. He didn't say anything. So on one hand, he's like doing a real good job as a leader, getting buy-in from all those people, from all those tribes, but he doesn't tell them what, why and what. I don't know about you, but I've been in leadership for quite a few years now, and, um, and, 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 and you know, usually when, you know, as, as a leader in the national movement, the Assemblies of God in the Netherlands, and then as a pastor for about 10 years, for almost 10 years, it, you know, people are desperate to know the why and the what they're supposed to do. They want to know strategy. They want to know vision. They want to know all that kind of stuff. Because otherwise, I'm not going to get them on board. They're like, you know, uh, you need to tell me something. You need to give me just a little bit more, you know, before I can commit to getting involved with this. However, it is just awesome to see that there are people who are willing to go, who are willing to, you know, uh, basically step out and do things for, for, for the leader of that nation without knowing why and what. Give me a handful of those kind of people, and I can change the world. You know, the problem is, as leaders, you know, I'm, I'm just being transparent with you right here, and I'm sure this is same, same is true for you, Pastor Glenn. I just don't always know where we're heading. I just kind of have a sense that, that the Holy Spirit is directing us to, us to go that way, and, you know, maybe to open up a second campus, do whatever, and we're going that way, and we're not going this way, we're not going that way, we're going that way, but I have no clue what, what's going to happen. I know, I know the first step after that, and God is, will have to reveal the next step after that and the next step after that. And some people can't hand it, handle that. They can't stand it, you know. So I think all of us, we really need to check our attitudes. All of us need to check our attitudes. You know, it's okay to ask questions. It's really okay. You know, you, you know as a pastor, you can ask me any question. I don't, may not have the answer to them, but you can ask me questions. But it's not okay to have a questioning spirit. You understand what I'm saying? What is the spirit behind the questions that you're asking? You know, all of us, we need to be willing to go before we understand everything. You know, there's a word called F-A-I-T-H, faith. That means that sometimes we just don't see what's next. But we know, uh, we, know we, can, we know that we can trust God. We know that we can trust our leaders. So we're going to go that way anyway because God tells us to, to go there even though we don't, we don't know all those details. That's faith. That's faith. So back from the 12 men to the priests. Verse 13. The priests will carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. As soon as their feet touch the water, the flow of water will be cut off upstream and the river will stand up like a, like a wall. Again, uh, this is pretty cool what's going on right here. It kind of shows you what kind of man Joshua was. There's just no mention that God actually told Joshua that, that he had to say this, that this is how it's going to happen. This is how he's going to lead the people across to the other side of the river. But Joshua believed that what God had done for Moses by parting the Red Sea, he could now do for them uh, with the Jordan River. And guess what? In the midst of all that, the priests were to take uh, leadership here upon Joshua's uh, word. They had to go first. They had to be willing to first get their feet wet. You know what? Joshua, the overall leader, he set the direction. We're going that way. And the spiritual leaders who served under him, they had to lead the way. They had to lead the way. You know, the same is true for us today. Jesus is our overall leader. I'm here with me on that one. Jesus is our overall leader, right? And 
the interesting thing that Jesus' name in Hebrew is, is Yeshua, right? So um, when you go to the name Joshua, the Hebrew version of that is kind of like the same, it's kind of like the same name, Yahushua. Same name. So Joshua serves as a type, as a foreshadow of who Jesus will be down the road. So, so whatever we can learn from Joshua is here, uh, it, it, has, it has bearing on how we advance God's kingdom in the world today. It's very applicable to what you guys are doing right here in Greenwich and what we're doing in the Netherlands. So Jesus commands spiritual leaders like your pastor and, and myself uh, to, to carry the ark of the Lord, which symbolizes the presence of God, and step into the water. I, as a leader, have to be willing to lead the way. The ark of the covenant goes before the people. Goes, God goes before us when a pastor or a leader steps out in faith. There's another cool thing here. You know, in the Old Testament, priests were kind of like an elite group of people. There were a special kind of people in those days. And they had, you know, special assignments. There was a whole lot of stuff written about them, for instance, in Leviticus, of course. And in our day, the tables have turned. Every single believer, every Christ follower, everyone here who has accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, every person is a priest. You know, a church like this one and ours, they, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. As a matter of fact, we also believe in the prophethood of all believers. Every person can hear from God. Every person can, can bring God's word into action and, and speak life over other people. You know, there's no more uh, clergy laity distinction that you maybe see, uh, see in a Catholic church or, or in, in many other religions around the world. It's good news, right? Yeah. It might be bad news for you, though. If you're just here and you try to keep a seat warm, throw a few dimes in your offering. That's not good news. Because you got to get working. you got to get going. you got to get your feet wet, right? So it's, it's bad news for those of you who are right here. So we need to all be willing to get our feet wet. And that, is, that takes me to, to point number two, take home number two. If you want to see God's promises fulfilled, write it down, you need to be willing to get your feet wet. Get your feet wet. Be willing to get your feet wet. In other words, we, you got to be willing to take a risk. you got to be willing to look ridiculous. Yeah, I'm serious. You know, when we sometimes do take steps in faith, it may look ridiculous to the people around us, to non-believers around us. It may even look ridiculous to other believers. Still, we have to do it because God tells us so. When you're a believer... That, mean, that means that you are a priest in your home, that you're a priest at your workplace, that you're a priest in your school, your neighborhood. That means that you need to be willing to take a first step and be willing to lead by example those people in your family, in the community who do not yet follow Jesus Christ. Get your feet wet. Take a step of faith. So the river then dries up as a result of the priest's feet touching the water. And they carry the Ark of the Covenant bring it to you know, like, the, like halfway in the river, and, and then they let all the other people, all the other Israelites pass through on dry land to the other side of the river. This kind of shows that spiritual leaders go before it, but they're also there where people are. That's why they stayed in the middle of the river. And, and then they, they kind of followed the rest of the people once, once all the other people were, were over on the other side. So they, they go before, they are there where people are at, and they, they stay behind for the people who are just a little slower, or maybe struggle to kind of catch on and, and take ownership, etc. And, and not only that, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, I, I said before, that it symbolizes the presence of God. So God's presence is not only before us, leading us, in a way, he's also behind us. You know, he, he, he has our back. God has our back. That's good news. God's presence is behind us as well. And a miracle happens because the priests are willing to get their feet wet. So are you, as a priest of Jesus Christ, willing to get your feet wet and see God do great things? Now, do you remember that Joshua told, you know, the whole story with the 12 tribes and the 12 people that that's a select there? We, we kind of pause on that one because, you know, the story pause on this one. And then, you know, finally Joshua is kind of making clear to them what they're supposed to do. You can find it in the fourth chapter. When all the people, this is verse 1, had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Now choose 12 men, one from each tribe. Tell them, take 12 stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. Carry them out and pile them up at the place where you will camp 
tonight, which is on the other side. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had chosen, one from each of the tribes of Israel. He told them, go in the mid, into the middle of the Jordan, in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it out on your shoulder, 12 stones in all, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. We will use these stones to build a memorial. This is real important. You just circle that one there in your Bible. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Then you can tell them to remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. So these stones were to serve as a memorial to the people of Israel of what God had done for them. This again shows you Joshua's heart. You know, he, he wanted to make sure that the, all the glory went to the Lord, not to himself. You know, it was great that he was a good leader, but it's all about Jesus. It's all about God. He gets the glory. He gets the honor. So let's take home number three. If you want to see God's promises fulfilled, you need to build memorials to God. Build memorials to God. You know, too often we build memorials to ourselves. I don't know about you, but, you know, we, we get involved in our careers, want to advance in our careers, want to make a lot of money. We, we you know, want to buy bigger houses, uh, buy bigger cars, you know, buy more shoes, ladies. I'm coming after you. You know, and you're kind of bragging to your friend, you know, I got 20 pairs. No, I got 50 pairs, you know. We've all been guilty of that, right? I've been guilty of that. Not, not the shoe part, but the other parts, maybe. <laughs> We've all been guilty. But it's not about us. We don't want to make a name for ourselves. We don't want people to kind of look at us, oh, this person is awesome, you know. God has blessed him. Whatever, you know, of course it's good that God blesses you and that, that people can see that. But it's not what it's about. we got to give glory to the Lord. You know, Thousand Hills Church is not a memorial to me. Harvest Time Church is not a memorial to Pastor Glenn. They're all memorials to Jesus Christ. He gets the glory. God wants that... God wants that everything that we do, we do it for the glory of God. He wants your life and my life to be a memorial of the great things that he has done in you and through you. That is, that is what life is all about. You know, and then when you look at the, the example of King Saul, the first king of the people of Israel, you know, he started out great. He loved God. You know, he did some great, you know, had some great military victories. And after the first military victory, this is what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 35. Then Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first of the altars he built to the Lord. Awesome. He served God. He wanted to honor God. But turn to the next chapter. And it says this. Early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. Then he went on to Gilgal. Saul started out okay, but then it all became about him. This was the beginning of the end for Saul, even before the other junk happened in his life. Pride comes before the fall. Now how about you? Are you building altars to God or are you building monuments to yourself? Are you living a God-first life or are you living a me-first life? you got to answer that question. I want to encourage you today to let your feet touch the water. Expect the Lord to do a miracle, to do something that only he can do so that you cannot take the credit for it. Take a leap of faith by getting involved in this church, by starting to serve, by starting to give, by maybe getting involved in the uh, building project and, and jump in with that. You know, you can do, you do what you can do and God will do what only he can do. Just imagine the thousands of people that will be touched, that can be touched once that building is there. It's just awesome to, to think of the po possibilities, the lives, the individual lives that will be transferred. I mean, some of you have had those experiences from coming to Harvest Time Church. I can, I can only dream about all these other people that will be touched as you guys move on with this. You put your foot in the water. God will part the Jordan River, work a miracle for this church, and in your life and in your family. Step out in faith and build an altar to God. Now, I've seen it time and again in our own church, you know, how every time we put our foot in the water, we're willing to get our feet wet, that God came through, that God provided miracles, that God did amazing things in our church and in our lives. I mean, one of the first things was, was that, um, you know, we, um, 
uh, we announced to some event evangelical pastors in our town, hey, we're going to start this international church here. We're going to have services in English. So I met with this one Pentecostal pastor, and I just can't. It was just awful. It was dreadful. He was like the most, the, the most discouraging person you would ever meet. You would never expect a pastor to be that way, right? This was, this was true. So I went to his house. He said, hey, we're going to start this church. He says, why are you doing that? All the internationals have left. There's nobody here that speaks English anymore. We have enough churches here. It's not, it's not going to thrive. It's not going to, it's going to fail. Why are you doing this? So he said, oh, well, thank you for the advice. We're, we're gone. <laughs> we're going to do it anyway because God told us so, right? So we did, and we opened the church. And on launch day, we had over 300 people there. Of course, the next week we had a Gideon revival, so it was down to about 150. And then we slowly started to build up to about 200. But, you know, we were willing to get our feet wet, and God came through. And then in 2012, we started the Dutch service because we felt like God wanted us to reach the people just right around our, our, our church building. And again, you know, people like, you know, why are you doing this, you know? People don't want to sit in a Dutch language service. We started, 50 people were added to the church that, that very first Sunday. And then, you know, today, like three years later, there's about 200 people worshiping God in, those, in a Dutch service. It's created growth. People's lives have been touched that we wouldn't have touched otherwise, all because, because, we, because we were willing to get our feet wet. And then in 2012, we also built our, uh, bought our church building that we've been in. You know, this building, it was kind of on the list to be torn down. And um, it was, the city owned it, and, and they, um, they said, hey, uh, we're going to redevelop. It's going to be an underground garage, underground supermarket, and about 30 apartments. It's going to be a multi-million euro dollar project. But you guys can borrow it for a few, uh, few years until we get started. So we were in there, and they allowed us to pay like a real low amount of rent, about maybe $3,000 per month. And then after you, they told us, hey, you cannot pay rent anymore because you're going to have rights to the building. We don't want you to have rights to the building. So you pay nothing. So we're like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> so we don't pay rent. So I started saving up money. <laughs> saving up money. Every month, we set aside like, I don't know, like $3,000 or whatever. And we saved that up for several years until the time came in 2011 that the city came to us again. They, they, they told us, hey, we're going to uh, cancel the project. Are you guys interested in buying the building for about $900,000? So I said, well, uh, you know, uh, we're a young church. We don't have a lot of money, but we can see what we can make happen here. So, um, so anyway, so we told him, we're going to look at it. But we, we need you to help us. Can you lease us the land and we buy the bricks? And they accepted our, our, our proposal there. And, and we started to, you know, we said, well, we have, we have $100,000 saved up here. Basically, that we didn't pay to them. So we had that money. And then we had some people that, uh, that gave some loans. And there, you know, we raised another 100000 We got a loan from the bank. And we were able to buy that building, which is unheard of for a church as young as we were at that time. It's amazing. But we were willing to get our feet back, uh, wet. We were willing to take risks. And God moved on our behalf. He gets the glory. And just recently, about a few weeks ago, we, you know, um, last year we saw that, that our attendance was going up again and that we needed to make some space for people. And we saw that there are a lot of people from this neighboring town. And we said, hey, we got we to gotta plant a church there. We got to plant a location there. And, we, you know, we got some people involved, and they were excited, and we did it. And um, so we started a location, and um, first Sunday, four weeks ago, Easter, 275 people. Crazy. Crazy to see that, you know, God is just drawing people to his church, you know, if it's a life-giving church. And again, we were willing to get our feet wet. He gets all the glory. It's not about us, not because I'm so smart or because our team is so good-looking or anything like that. It's because God is, is at work, because God wants to work miracles in our midst. And you know, uh, right now we're running about at a little over 100 people, which is a great number to get started with a, with, with a new, new church. You know, we were willing to get our feet wet, and we saw God do miracles, and God got the glory. We, were, we are always building memorials to Him. Now, are you willing to get your feet wet, see God work miracles in your life? You need to be willing to get your feet wet if you want to if you want to see the Red Sea to part, ask Moses. 
need to be willing to get your feet wet if you want to see uh, the, um, the Jordan River to part. Ask Joshua. You need to be willing to get your feet wet if you want, if you want, if you want to walk on, on water. Ask Peter. You may be wondering, yeah, but Peter sank. Yeah, Peter did sink. But he also experienced a miracle. And if he would have kept his eyes focused on Jesus, he would still be walking on water today. Don't you believe that with me? You know what? We need to get our eyes focused on Jesus. Just like Peter should have instead of looking at the waves around him. You know, Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the center of it all. It's all about him. We build an altar to him, not a monument to ourselves. We bring glory to him, to the one who died on the cross for our sins so that we could be forgiven and, and, and who rose up on the third day so that we know that we have eternal life on that side of eternity and that we could have abundant life on this side of eternity. Uh, of eternity. You know, I truly believe, I truly believe, and, and, and this is what God spoke to me as I prepared this message. I truly believe that as you guys keep moving, as you guys are all jumping into the water, ready to get your feet wet, that this church here in Greenwich will reach 10,000s of people. If you guys are just willing to take a risk, to be willing to look ridiculous, he's going to do it. You know that there will be a day pretty soon that baptizing a thousand people on, in one year is, you know, a, like a new normal for this church. That there will be a day when that every Sunday there will be scores of people who get saved, healed, and delivered. There will be a day when the global impact of this church will be multiplied and multiplied and multiplied all over again. I believe that. Psalm 2 verse 8 says this. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. This is a word for you, Harvest Time. The next decade is going to be a decade of supernatural increase. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Keep praying. Keep believing. Start moving. Get your feet wet. Build an altar to God, not a monument to yourself. Hey, let's all stand up. Let's, let's raise up, lift up our lands to the Lord. Let's just pray. Let's believe God. Let's believe God for miracles. Father, we just want to come to you, Lord, right now. We want to thank you, Father, for your word. We want to thank you, Lord, that Joshua led the way for his people, that you are leading uh, the way for us, Lord Jesus. And, Father, we thank you, Father, that we are all priests, that we all need to get our feet wet, Father. And I just pray for those who are still doubting, who are still doubting whether they should stay, take a step or not. Father, that, that they will get in and see you move, Lord, in mighty ways. See you part the Jordan River. For, for this church, for this amazing church, God. Father, I just want to pray for those who need to start their faith journey today, that they will get their feet wet and start trusting, putting their lives in the hands of Jesus this, this morning. Father, I want to pray for those who need to get plugged back into church who are here today who are wondering, is this a church that they need to be part of? Father, I just pray, Lord, that they would jump in and, 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 and get their feet wet and become part of this church and start serving and giving and doing great things for you. Father, making the name of Jesus famous, Lord through Harvest Time Church here in Greenwich, Father. I thank you, Lord, for the amazing things that you have in store for this church, that better days are ahead than, than are in the past, Lord. God, you, you, you want to do great things in, in our midst here. Father, your word said, like what we just read, ask me and I'll make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. Father, we grab hold of that promise. We lay hold of that promise for Harvest Time Church. God, we thank you for working on our behalf, for doing great things, Lord, for providing for each person in this room, Lord, and for, for, for just building up faith, stirring up faith in our hearts, Lord, to, to get involved and to jump in, Lord, and to get our feet wet. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Let's, let's lift up a, a roar of praise to him.